Hello, welcome to the 11th Annual Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies Senior Research Forum. I'm Dana Molina, Associate Director of the Center, and I want to thank you all for tuning in to this virtual event. The purpose of the forum is to showcase some of the outstanding economic policy-related research produced by matriculating seniors in the Department of Economics each year. We would like to thank all the faculty advisors for their nominations for this forum and to the selected students for their hard work preparing their presentations. This year's senior presenters include Nelson Dimpter. Nelson's thesis focuses on the resolvability perceptions of U.S. global banks as measured by total loss absorbing capacity eligible debt. Nelson's thesis advisor is Nobuhiro Kiyotaki. Yu Jong Lee. Yu Jung's thesis looks at climate change and the spatial distribution of socioeconomic vulnerability in flood-prone coastal regions. Yu Jung's thesis advisor is Stephen Redding. Emily Filippides. Emily's research looks at the effects of wages and minimum wage increases on delinquency risk for residential mortgages. Emily's thesis advisor is Ernest Liu. Anna Pranger. Anna's research investigates the impact of financial access to abortion on women's economic outcomes. Anna's thesis advisor is Emma Harrington. And last, Caroline Skinner. Caroline's thesis examines market efficiency in NFL point spread markets after the legalization of sports betting. Caroline's thesis advisor is Sylvain Chastain. Thank you again for tuning in for this virtual forum and your support of undergraduate research at Princeton. Hi everyone, my name is Nelson Dimpter and I'm excited to be presenting on my thesis titled Resolvability Perceptions of U.S. Global Systemically Important Banks as Measured by Total Loss Absorbing Capacity Eligible Debt. I'd like to once again thank my advisor, Professor Kiyotaki, for all of his help and insights throughout this entire research process. To start, my topic is an important element that goes into bank resolution planning. And the resolution plan is a strategy for rapid and orderly wind down of a financial institution under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code in the event of material financial distress or failure. This is a Dodd-Frank Act reform aimed at ending too big to fail. There's public and private versions of these plans. The public ones are substantially scaled back in the information they share, which is why the Federal Reserve Board and FDIC jointly review the private versions and issue their findings and to the extent which they believe that these plans would lead to a viable resolution of the firm. Key elements, there's several of them, but the important one for my thesis is the capital resources of the firm and how they behave over time. So the key concept underlying resolution is that the parent entity of a financial firm in resolution suffers losses while the subsidiaries that perform critical economic functions continue to operate, limiting disruptions of financial stability. This means that the parent creditors and shareholders are on the hook for firm-wide losses that may originate at the banking group. The creditors are bailed in as opposed to a bailout occurring where funds come from external sources such as the government or taxpayers, the creditors are forced to fund the failure of the firm and the wind down of the firm. This means that the operating entities are safe relative to the parent and the plans go over this process. There's a lot of mechanisms behind it, but the plans get into this. Right here, the schematic has a sample holding company that this is the parent of the firm and its assets consist of equity stakes and all the operating subsidiaries. These are the ones that actually perform banking functions and are important to the economy more so than the, the holding company, which is simply the conglomerate of all these subsidiaries, as well as some managerial duties. But any losses that originated throughout the banking group, if the firm were to enter resolution, would be sent up to the parent. The parents, stakeholders, in this case, creditors and shareholders, are going to be able to sufficiently cover these losses while the firm goes through bankruptcy proceedings. And the subsidiaries will have the resources provided by the parent equity holders and shareholders to be able to continue to operate, limiting disruptions to the financial stability. So the actual capital that's relevant to resolution is referred to as TLAC, total loss absorbing capacity, and it's the equity and bail ineligible debt that can be used to absorb losses and recapitalize the bank group. There are regulations that require a specific minimum of each, both the debt and equity, to be scaled relative to the assets and the size of the firm. The debt that is TLAC eligible must meet very specific requirements. That way, the investors, the public, the regulatory agencies and the firm have clear uh, anchored expectations on exactly how this security would perform in the event the firm enters resolution. The rule was adopted requiring certain levels in 2017 with full compliance in 2019. So at this point, there's a few years of evidence of how this market has performed and how the, the rule was implemented. 
And right here is a camp, a sample capital structure. It includes going concern liabilities of the, of the parent, which are generally considered the equity, which will absorb losses first. And then following the depletion of equity, generally the firm will enter resolution and will no longer be a going concern, but uh, it will be a gone concern situation where junior subordinated debt, as well as other forms of debt may be vulnerable to losses. Senior holding company debt or senior parent debt is what's important to resolution. That's the TLAC discussed in this paper. And then the senior operating company debt is subsidiary debt that should not be impacted and excluded liabilities are liabilities of depositors. This is all calibrated to trigger the firm to file for bankruptcy well before uh, excluded liabilities and hopefully senior op co debt would not be implicated in the wind down of the firm. So since there's no way to clearly measure resolution, there needs to be a proxy developed as a way of measuring the perceptions of this process and its, its viability uh, since there has been no widespread resolution event since the implementation, implementation of these rules. So because Balin applies the TLAC eligible debt of the parent entity and not that of subsidiaries, the difference between the yield of parent TLAC debt and similar non-TLAC subsidiary debt can be referred to as the Balin risk premium. There's gonna be a spread because they're due to resolution guidelines, the parent debt is inherently riskier than that of the subsidiaries, even though it's very similar in almost all cases, except for the fact of it's being issued by a parent or subsidiary. And for that reason, this measure can be exploited to look at perceptions of resolvability over time. The first way of measuring this was doing a match spread, taking bonds within the same issuer, those that are issued from the parent, those that are issued from the subsidiary, and looking at those that have a remaining maturity within a six month window and matching these together and differencing them, and then taking an average of the differences from all of these pairs and creating an index out of it. This is great for isolating confounding variables that could impact uh, you know, one firm over another, but at the same time, if a firm is for whatever reason, does not issue as much debt from the subsidiaries, it can skew it in the direction of certain firms that choose to issue more debt from their operating entities. To get a more complete measure, a more robust measure, uh, average spread took the difference of the TLAC bonds of the parents and the non-TLAC bonds of their subsidiaries, and then just difference these two spreads. This is a more complete measure, but at the same time, it does not account for various uh, firm specific factors, but these can be reduced and explained by including controls in the panel regression that I will discuss a bit later. And then the final um, spread measure is instead of taking the spreads of the match or average spread as the dependent variable in the panel regression, simply just put the yields of every security in the sample into it and then have a dummy variable that corresponds to whether or not the issuing entity is a parent or subsidiary, since this is perfectly correlated with the vulnerability of that security to be used as bail-in during a resolution event, or if it would not be, it serves as a great proxy to measure exactly what the amount attributable to the issuing entity status and therefore its vulnerability and resolution, uh, what that simple classification impact it has on spreads. So the sample was 890 active bonds issued by all of the US global systemically important banks and sourced from Bloomberg. So to start, this is the First spread measure that I discussed, um, and the second, the match and average bail and risk premium. They're generally consistent over time. This divergence here is due to that matching uh, methodology uh, issue with it skewing towards specific firms. Um, but despite this COVID disruption, which I'll discuss in a bit, the, the trend has been similar between the two and largely positive over time. Next, this is just disaggregating that average uh, spread that I discussed with the parent TLAC on the top and the non TLAC subsidiary debt on the bottom, the difference we looked at on the previous slide here, this is just zoomed out more complete over time. It's worth noting that during COVID, both yields on both type of, types of instruments did blow out and increase substantially. Uh, it's just a matter of the relative performance that caused us to go positive and negative, which I'll cover in a bit. So first, I was looking to see if this bail and risk premium is in fact positive and significant as resolution theory would suggest, and then also what firm market and regulatory factors influence it. So to do this, constructed a panel data set of bonds with daily measures of bond yields, quarterly accounting measures related to each firm's you know, general financial health, like debt, book value, and equity, as well as daily risk variables, such as credit default swaps, uh, firm, or you know, just general, a general CDS index, a volatility index of equities and treasury spreads. Uh, these should account for many, many things that determine the, the yield of these firms and of these instruments. 
Then next was to run a panel regression with firm fixed effects, clustered standard errors, and variables associated with firm market and bond risk factors to determine exactly what is influencing the spread on these bonds. And then finally, to perform an event study analysis to identify the impact of resolution news updates on the spread indexes, since the agencies have a substantially more insight into the true resolvability of the firms based on the private plans, it would make sense that the, their feedback based on these plan submissions could be moving these spread measures. So to start, is there a statistically significant positive bail-in risk premium? Uh, yes, it ranges from 24 to 44 basis points across uh, spread measures and methodologies and models. Uh, this is consistent with prior research across jurisdictions and time that puts us in a range of 14 to 70 basis points. The factors that drive it, one is the parent subsidiary, subsidiary credit notch differential. This is a measure of the credit worthiness difference between the parent and the subsidiary. The parent generally has a lower credit rating, not only because they are responsible for the firm wide losses, but also because they are seeing a diminished potential, the credit rating agencies see a less of a potential of governmental support in the event of trouble. And for that reason, the parent is more likely to have to deal with the full amount of losses that could originate throughout the banking group. And as this credit notch differential has widened over time, um, as a result of successful resolution implementation, there has been holding loss constant an increase in these, uh, these spreads in the bail-in risk premium. Higher frequency market risk factors and quarter are much more predictive than quarterly uh, metrics. This is because the higher frequency measures are, are simply uh, measures of broader market sentiment and influence all yields uh, across instruments in the, in the economy. And for that reason, uh, quarterly metrics that while they may be important, simply were not as predictive of the, the variation, the daily variation in these spreads that moves much more so with broader trends in uh, market risk tolerance. During COVID, the volatility period here, the dash for cash caused a sell-off in both instruments, but the, the sell-off in non-bail-in debt of subsidiaries was substantially greater than that in the bail-in debt sell-off, which is why there was a, a bit of a uh, suppression in the spreads uh, across both of the measures graphed here. Uh, this does contradict resolution theory, but at the same time, this was a period of irrationality in markets. People just wanted liquidity. They wanted to, to have you know, money instead of the uh, debt of subsidiaries of large banks. And for that reason, there, though the sell-off was greater in subsidiary debt, which contradicts the theory, it's not necessarily indicative of the fact that investors did not believe or did not understand resolution. And um, was an interesting case, but uh, an unexpected finding, but still um, does not mean that resolution was not, was not considered during this time. And then finally, the public plan releases and agency feedback had no significant change, even though the agencies have more information. Um, when they release this feedback, it doesn't seem to drive the, um, the change in these spreads. So finally, for policy implications, the bail-in risk premium forces firms to internalize resolution costs. Uh, this is a success from the policymaker perspective and causes them to have to pay more for this resolution uh, eligible debt. And for that reason, it's imposing market discipline on the firms and increasing their funding costs. COVID was the first real stress event since the financial crisis, but governmental support uh, for all, you know, widespread uh, across the economy for all types of um, businesses and individuals meant that resolution regimes remained untested. Um, no firm, large financial firm failed as a result of the COVID pandemic and resolution still remains untested. Um, agencies should continue to promote orderly resolution. The fact that this premium is positive and has been stable over time means that there are expectations baked in over how this would, would perform in practice. So the agencies should continue to do their jobs, reviewing plans, supervising the rules, and promoting resolution guidance. Um, but unfortunately, a real resolution event will be the only way of knowing the robustness of resolution planning and TLAC measures. And until that occurs, which will be a, probably a pretty scary day, uh, the best we can do is prepare in the meantime. So that wraps up my presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to discuss this today. Hi, everyone. My name is Yu Zhang, and I'm so excited to present my senior thesis on the effect of sea level rise on residential flooding patterns or who lives in flood zone coastal regions and why. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the wonderful Professor Stephen Redding for his guidance this past year, as well as the Griswold Center for this opportunity. So jump right in, there are three key observations which motivated my research question. First, coastal flooding events are increasing in intensity and frequency. 
According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, sea levels are projected to rise between 10 and 12 inches in the next 30 years, increasing high damage flooding frequency by a tenfold. This not only increases the stakes associated with living along the coast, but also changes our perception of risk and risk horizon. We often think of sea level rise as a long-term, gradual problem to deal with in the future, but in reality, the future might be a lot nearer than we previously anticipated. Second, federal natural disaster recovery programs and policies prioritize homeowners and owner-occupied properties. Um, unlike owner-occupied properties, rental units are not eligible for federal disaster recovery assistance, which means there's usually a, a delay in the recovery of affordable uh, rental housing units following major flooding events. And it also translates into an in, a 30 percentage point increase in eviction rates in some states following flooding events. Even in terms of preventative policies, flood insurance comprises just 2% of the National Flood Insurance Program, which results in a disproportionate concentration of risk among tenants and lower income tenants in particular. Finally, existing studies on flood risk do not differentiate between property owners and tenants. Now, given the changing intensity and frequency of flooding events, as well as differences in coverage under disaster policies, one would assume property owners and tenants would respond to flood risks differently. Um, in addition, given the substitution between the rental and purchasing markets, it's important to differentiate between these two types of consumers, or we might also lead to inaccurate or misleading estimates of the effect of flood risk on property values as well. So as of yet, it is unclear how flood risk affects tenants in particular, but also just pricing overall in terms of property values as well as rental values. So this brings me to my overarching question, which is who lives in flood prone coastal regions and why? I'm primarily interested in the direct effect of coastal flooding risk on property values and who pays these prices to live in flood prone areas. Uh, the effect of flood risk on coastal housing values is heavily debated in the existing economic literature with some studies finding no effect at all and other studies finding a negative effect of flood risk on housing values. And these inconsistencies arise uh, from differences in geographic focus. So where in the US they're looking at the type of risk preference model used, they use a loss aversion model or a Bayesian updating model their choice of related covariates, so household level beliefs in climate change or partisan affiliation, for example, and their choice of exogenous variables. Do they account for vertical land motions, the tectonic activity, uh, coastal proximity, seasonal temperature patterns, etc. Expanding on the geographical scope question in particular, uh, as seen in this map from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, it's clear that flooding risk varies widely across the U.S. Um, and here I've circled a couple areas with very high flooding risk. And a lot of studies tend to generalize the West Coast as having less flood risk compared to the East and Gulf Coast, but flood risk varies at a much more granular level. And that's why looking at geographic slope is also important because flood risk, uh, risk disclosure requirements vary widely um, from state by state, despite sharing similar levels of flood risk as in the circled areas here. Um, so in states like Texas, Louisiana, and Missouri, for example, sellers are required to disclose all information about past flooding history, damages, insurance coverage, and costs. Whereas in neighboring Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, sellers aren't required to disclose any information at all. But I account for the meteorological and policy differences by segmenting the U.S. coastline into six different regions consistent with NASA's interagency report on sea level rise. I also attempt to remedy some of the inconsistencies with modeling in the literature by proposing home ownership as an alternative proxy for revealed risk preferences. So instead of making assumptions about what type of variables may be relevant to an individual's housing decision. I assume these preferences are reflected in their housing decisions, whether they choose to rent or to buy. I additionally incorporate information disclosure requirements into my analysis 
um, in evaluating the price effects as well in evaluating price effects without uh, ensuring that individuals or residents in the area have access to reliable and accurate flooding information. Uh, it's difficult to estimate the effect of flood risk on prices. So in terms of my methodology, I combine five data sets on flood risk, rent, uh, and transaction prices, demographic information, mortgage financing and accessibility, and municipal engagement. For my analysis, I use a causal mediation framework to isolate the effect of flood risk on housing and rent prices from the effect of flood risk on an individual's housing choice decision, so whether they choose to rent or buy. By comparing the effect of flood risk on residential flooding patterns, both independent of and conditional on prices, I can isolate or identify to what extent prices mediate or explain this decision. Is this person choosing to rent or buy a home because of cheaper prices resulting from flood, from flood risk or because of flood risk itself. Now, to look at my key results, starting with the price effects, I find that consistent with my hypothesis, homeowners discount flood risk more heavily than do renters, with property values decreasing by 31% with each unit increase in flood risk in some areas and rent prices by 13.4%. Now, obviously this effects vary widely depending on where in the US you are, depending on your region. So on the right here, I highlight uh, the Pacific Northwest in particular. And the key takeaway here is just that the effect of risk score on median property values compared to median rent values is statistically and significantly different from one another. Now in regions with similar flooding risk but different state level disclosure policies, I find that mandatory disclosure significantly dis decreases property values by an additional 43% and rent prices by an additional 34%. Oh, now it's important to note here that I don't take into account state level differences in cost of living, uh, industry and labor market composition, and that these disclosure uh, differences are solely based on uh, differences in disclosure policies conditional on similar flood risk. Now for my residential sorting effects, I find that flood risk significantly increases home ownership rates, meaning more people choose to purchase a home instead of rent one uh, conditional on flood risk. Now, interestingly, this effect is not mediated by prices, meaning the increase in home ownership rates is not driven by cheaper purchasing values compared to rent. Uh, in fact, price explains changes in rentership rates by risk, but not the home ownership rates. Now to substantiate this analysis, the difference between uh, renters and homeowners, uh, I further examine the demographic distribution of renters and homeowners along race, age, and educational attainment lines um, based on the assumption that the population and sample of renters is fundamentally different from the population sample of homeowners, that the distribution of age, age and education differ between renters and homeowners. Um, and I actually find that uh, price largely mediates the demographic distribution differences along race, age, and education, um, but information disclosure magnifies inequities along these lines um, by increasing the share of minority residents in a given tract by up to 83%, decreasing the share of college educated residents by up to 24%, and increasing the share of young homeowners and senior tenants, both of whom may be financially and physically more vulnerable to flooding events. These independent non-mediated effects of flood risk on demographic sorting patterns suggest that housing prices may not be the most appropriate measure of revealed preference and that the housing and location decisions made in the presence of reliable information could serve as an important proxy for individual willingness and ability to pay for safety. In recent years, different states have begun introducing policies to ban the construction of new properties and evict residents from high-risk areas. FEMA's long outdated flood maps were also revised earlier this year. 
However, my research suggests that these policies and changes may not be best suited to address the compound challenges faced by tenants along the coast. Specifically, the concentration of the most vulnerable populations in regions with mandatory information disclosure raises questions as to potential discrimination on behalf of sellers and landlords in selectively disclosing flooding information. Additionally, the current focus on asset-oriented recovery programs as opposed to people-oriented policies propose incentives and disincentives that could challenge the implementation of future climate resilient policies. Finally, as I mentioned previously, I don't look at the labor market or industry composition uh, along the coast, but depending on changes to residential tenure and housing decisions, the composition and the stickiness of the labor market and economic activity in these regions could change. Within the scope of this paper, I don't examine how homeownership rates and demographics have changed along the coast in response to changing climate risk. However, my findings on the differential effect of flood risk on the flooding decision of various population subgroups emphasize a need for additional research on what climate risk vulnerability looks like and how existing climate resilience policies mitigate or exacerbate these multidimensional and intersectional inequalities. Future research could expand upon this information gap arising from differences in disclosure requirements in examining and examine trends in residential sorting patterns over time. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Filipides and I will be presenting on the effect of wages and minimum wage increases on delinquency risk for residential mortgages in the US. Many thanks to my advisor, Ernest Liu, for his support and guidance on my thesis. This is an overview of what I'll be going over in the presentation. So for context, in my paper, I take two separate approaches to explore uh, essentially different flavors of the same overarching question. And this is why I divide the core of my presentation into two sections. This will become more clear as I move along in the presentation. So with that, let's just jump right into it. So here's some background. I'm gonna start off with an explanation as to why understanding and exploring delinquency risk is important. And that's because at a high level, late mortgage payments have negative consequences for both the lender and the borrower lender because it interferes with expected cash flow streams. In other words, lender doesn't receive their payments on time. And the borrower, because it damages their credit, it results in accrued interest payments, late fees, et cetera. So there's this double trigger hypothesis, which states that homeowners who have negative equity and experience a negative income shock are at high risk of default because they can't sell their property to recuperate the mortgage principal. Uh, so this suggests that there are two key drivers of delinquency, severe income loss and negative equity. Uh, however, there is a disconnect between theoretical and empirical findings on the role of income shocks on delinquencies. Theoretical findings suggest that severe income loss contributes the most to people's payment decisions, but many empirical studies suggest that it plays an insignificant role in whether homeowners make mortgage payments and some of the more important factors are the type of mortgage, the interest rate on the loan, the loan to value ratio, the term of the loan, the initial loan amount, et cetera. The goal of this paper is to look at the effect of wage changes on delinquency patterns in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. And I take two separate but related approaches, which I describe next. Section one covers the first approach, which considers how aggregate delinquency patterns are affected by aggregate wage fluctuations. The goal of this section is to consider at a high level how income changes affect mortgage delinquencies before we get into how state minimum wage increases affect people's mortgage payments. Here I consider whether county level delinquency rates are affected by aggregate wage changes. Though it makes sense that higher wages would alleviate debt constraints, the extent to which wage changes actually help borrowers meet large mortgage payments is unclear. Also, the primary challenge in empirically estimating the relationship between borrowers' wages uh, or income changes and default decisions is the availability of data that includes mortgage characteristics at origination and payment status over time, in addition to socioeconomic variables describing the borrower. Survey data has been used in previous literature, but this data is typically very limited, and we may be concerned about various biases and measurement errors posing threats to internal and external validity. 
My approach is to estimate the effect of voice changes on delinquency patterns at the aggregate level using a two-way fixed effects model. Entity fixed effects control for emitted variables that vary across entities, but not over time, while time fixed effects control for variables that vary over time, but are constant across entities, such as nationwide changes in technological innovations or productivity. Mortgage data is averaged across different geographic locations by quarter and merged with data tracking aggregate wage measures in those same locations. This approach allows us to consider a much more comprehensive, large, and varied example of mortgages than previous studies have. And the two primary data sources I use for this come from CoreLogic's Loan Level Market Analytics Module and the Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages, which is a program within the Peru of Labor Statistics. The data sets are described on this slide. However, one thing I'd like to point out is that wage data reported by county is based on the physical location of establishments. Here's a little more info about the data. The mortgage data is aggregated across, on average, nearly 6,000 unique loans per county for each quarter between 2012 and 2016. In total, over 1 billion observations on loan performance are aggregated across 2,913 counties and 20 periods, which forms a balanced data set with over 58,000 rows. Merging is then performed with QCEW data, tracking wages and county unemployment, keyed on the county code, the year, and the quarter. I would also like to mention that I use multiple other data sources. Specifically, I use data from Zillow on house prices and uh, data from the USDA Economic Research Service on county, rural, urban codes, and commuting zones. But the, the figure here represents a map of all counties considered after merging all the various data sets together. Darker regions correspond to more data availability. As you can see from the color legend, I only include counties with at least 55 unique loans recorded in any one quarter. This slide describes the econometric setup for my empirical strategy. One point to clarify is that only first lien fixed rate residential mortgages originated between 2010 and 2014 are considered, but these loans are observed for several months between 2012 and 2016. Also, a variety of mortgage and county characteristics are included to control for variables that vary over time within counties. I, sh I show this more on the next slide. And finally, due to the panel structure of the data, standard errors are clustered at the county level to account for serial correlation and delinquency rates within each county. This here is a table with summary statistics of all the independent variables, including the county-specific wage data, the mortgage characteristics, and other county-specific data. This here is a table with summary statistics of the dependent variables I consider, which are each tested separately. The first variable is simply the percentage of loans in any sort of delinquency state. This includes loans that are 30, 60, or 90 plus days delinquent. It also includes loans where the property is under foreclosure or real estate owned, which is called REO. You might notice that the mean delinquency rate is relatively low compared to what you might see reported by other sources, but there's a reason for this. Bear in mind that only loans originated between 2010 and 2014 are considered in this analysis, and the composition of loans within each county changes over time. So the average delinquency rate begins at zero in the first quarter of 2010 and gradually increases as more loans advance from their origination date. The second variable is the default rate. So this is the percentage of loans that are 90 plus days delinquent under foreclosure or real estate owned. The other two variables capture how loans move in and out of delinquency over time. The third variable is the percentage of loans that were current in the previous month but are now delinquent, while the fourth variable is the percentage of loans that were delinquent in the previous month but are now current or paid off. These are my principal results. I find that a 1% increase in the average wage of a county induces first a 0.0073 percentage point decrease in the percentage of loans delinquent, second a 0.0048 percentage point decrease in the percentage of loans in default, and third a 0.0087 percentage point decrease in the percentage of current loans that become delinquent. Note that while the coefficients are statistically significant at the 5% level, 
the effect sizes are minimal. Um, I would also like to mention some of my regressal stacks. First, I omit year by quarter fixed effects and replace these with state by year fixed effects to account for unobserved time varying features specific to each state, such as statewide policies that change each year. I find that my results are largely robust to the inclusion of state by year fixed effects. One last thing I would like to point out is by regressing countywide delinquency variables on countywide wages, we are implicitly assuming that mortgagers live and work in the same county. In reality, however, we should expect considerable cross county commuting. So to account for this possibility, uh, the analysis I did is repeated with observations grouped by commuting zone rather than by county. The empirical strategy is the same as I described, except county fixed effects are replaced with zone fixed effects, and standard errors are clustered at the zone level. The stability of the coefficients on the delinquency and default rate outcome variables suggests that grouping by seemingly arbitrary political units cannot explain our results. It's plausible that the effect sizes could depend on how rural or urban a county is. To test this hypothesis, I repeat the regression separately for counties that are rural and urban using the USDA's County Rural Urban Hills, or RUCC. I find a larger effect size across rural counties, suggesting that homeowners in rural areas respond more to wage increases than homeowners in urban areas. One possible explanation is that the income effect is greater for borrowers in urban areas than for borrowers in rural areas. My analysis is not without its limitations. Here on this slide are some important factors to consider. I address these potential limitations in my paper and try to account for them in various ways, but I won't get into that now for the sake of time. One thing though I would definitely like to point out is that because the regression is not implemented at the household level, we cannot reasonably deduce a relationship between delinquencies and wages at the household level. Even if households' wages were observed over time, we would lose the within household variation by aggregating the data across counties. For example, it's unclear whether a negative data coefficient implies that people who experience wage increases are delinquent at higher rates, or simply that people living in counties with high wage growth are delinquent at higher rates. So it's important to keep in mind that inferences drawn from this analysis must be kept at the aggregate level. This next section looks at the effect of statewide minimum wage increases on mortgage payment decisions, which could point us to those important policy considerations. The findings of the previous section suggest that mortgage delinquencies move opposite to wage increases. It makes sense then why we might expect minimum wage increases to reduce a homeowner's probability of delinquency, assuming no simultaneous increase in consumption expenditures or other debt obligations. At the same time, though, minimum wage hikes may increase the probability of unemployment. So the effect of a minimum wage increase on the probability of delinquency depends on the relative strength of the potential positive and negative income shocks. This is essentially what I try to disentangle here. Uh, while the response of debt to policy implementations is a common theme in existing literature, there has been relatively little research on the effect of minimum wage increases on mortgage delinquency specifically. Only a few other studies estimate the effect of minimum wage increases on delinquencies, and no other study to my knowledge has looked particularly at West Virginia and its programs. Specifically, this section studies the effects of two consecutive minimum wage increases in West Virginia on residential mortgage delinquencies between 2012 and 2016 for loans originated again between 2010 and 2014. The first increase took effect in January 2015, raising the minimum wage from $7.25 to $8, and the second increase in January 2016, which raised the minimum wage from $8 to $8.75. In contrast, the minimum wages in West Virginia's three bordering states, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Kentucky, remained constant throughout the decade. This is a map of all 2,669 zip codes considered for the analysis. Uh, essentially, drug regions correspond to zip codes with more data availability. Notice that zip codes along the outskirts of each state are not colored. This is because all zip codes with geographic coordinates less than 15 miles from a state border are removed from the data completely. 
This is the, this is to reduce the possibility of counting loans for which borrowers may work across state borders. In other words, borrowers who might live in West Virginia but earn wages in one of the bordering states and would therefore be relatively unaffected by a minimum wage increase in West Virginia. So now to get into my empirical strategy, I define a difference in differences regression with one treatment group and two post-period windows, each one year in length. However, it should be noted that a variety of pre-period and post-period windows are tested for your business. Furthermore, three states comprise the control group in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Kentucky. The econometric setup is presented on the slide, but the important takeaway is that beta 1 and beta 2 measure the average causal effect on treated loans in 2015 and 2016, respectively. Standard errors are also clustered at the zip code level to account for serial correlation in the outcome within each zip code. Uh, here are the derivations for the average causal effect on treated loans in 2015 and 2016. This is a very important slide. The difference in differences framework assumes that trends in the outcome variable would be the same between treatment and control groups in the absence of treatment, and that a deviation from the common trend is induced only when the treatment comes into effect. This is known as a parallel trends assumption. To explore the validity of the parallel trends assumption, I averaged each outcome variable across six month periods for each of the four states. Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Kentucky are not grouped together here so that trends can be compared across the three states. The figure on this slide shows a time series plot for the four outcome variables, which I described in detail earlier. Notice that overall, the trends initially fluctuate together, but West Virginia's trends appear to deviate from those of the other states in the second half of 2015. We take these findings as strong support for the assumption of parallel pre-trends for all the outcome variables. Here are my principal findings. Uh, relative to the outcomes in the pre-period in West Virginia, we find first the probability of being 30 plus days of imprint increased in 2015 and increased in 2016. Second, the probability of being in default increased in 2015 and increased in 2016. And similarly, the probability of being current in one month and current delinquent in the next month increased in 2015 and also increased in 2016. For each outcome, a joint hypothesis test suggests that the 2015 and 2016 effects are statistically different from each other. But overall, these results are not what we might expect from a minimum wage increase. One possible explanation that I'll just put out there is that the minimum wage raises in West Virginia might have led to an increase in debt finance consumption that ultimately spurred more delinquencies and defaults. So if this theory that greater debt finance consumption from minimum wage hikes triggers more delinquency and default occurrences, then we might expect that households in more financially precarious situations uh, will experience the largest effect. To explore this conjecture, I estimate the effect of treatment on default probability separately for individuals with high, medium, and low LTV and BTI ratios at origination relative to other borrowers in the same state. The reason why I group by state is because of differences in mortgage lending practices and legislation across states that might cause the average LTV or UTI ratios among borrowers in one state to be substantially higher than those among borrowers in another state. Uh, we see from this table that the effect in 2016 is more prominent among individuals with higher LTV and higher UTI, suggesting that individuals with lower initial equity in their home and tighter initial debt constraints are more affected by minimum wage increases. My principal findings are robust to changes in the pre-treatment window, shortening the pre-treatment window to include just 2013 and 2014, so removing 2012, has little effect on the outcome coefficients. As an aside, I also test different post-period windows to verify that the effects observed are specific to 2015 and 2016, and I find that they in fact are. Uh, the bottom half of this slide describes how I altered my analysis in various ways for robustness, but for the sake of time, I won't get into that in this presentation. Uh, just to summarize, so it's important to keep in mind the nuances of the different empirical strategies used in each section and what these results might suggest about minimum wage policy as a particular type of wage increase. The important takeaway of this presentation is that mortgage debt response 
from wage changes is complex. On the one hand, mortgage payments may respond positively to aggregate wage increases, but on the other hand, homeowners may be less likely to meet payments after a statewide minimum wage increase. So future researchers and policymakers should bear in mind that minimum wage policies may not realize their intended effects. This slide lists some potential future research considerations, and with that, I will conclude my presentation. I would like to extend many thanks to my advisor, Ernest Liu, for his guidance and to the Griswold Center for this opportunity. Hello, my name is Anna Pranger, and today I'll be presenting my thesis, The Impact of Financial Access to Abortion on Women's Economic Outcomes, Evidence for Medicaid Coverage. Before I begin, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Emma Harrington, who was fabulous throughout this process, and to the Griswold Center for inviting me to speak today. So to start, I'd like to go through an abstract um, about what this thesis was on. So I knew I wanted to write about abortion access, but I ended up narrowing my focus to ask the research question, how does the actual cost of abortion factor into women's economic decisions? To answer this question, I leveraged variations in state Medicaid policies over space and time between 2010 and 2019, as well as a difference in differences and when possible, a triple differences specification to find significant impacts of financial access to abortion on women's educational outcomes and smaller, less significant impacts on their labor outcomes. Overall, I conclude that financial access to abortion increases a woman's ability to invest in their own human capital and to participate more fully in the labor market. Before I continue, I'd like to note that I know not everyone who would need an abortion is a woman. I just assume that the average impact on women will hold for all the populations that could potentially be impacted by these abortion coverage rules. And so moving on, um, as a way of motivating this thesis, I'm going to go through a quick institutional background. So most of the economic literature on abortion focuses on physical barriers. Think waiting periods, restrictions on providers, and distance from clinics. Uh, I wanted to look at the cost, the actual physical cost of obtaining the procedure, not including travel or opportunity costs or anything else, because an abortion can cost as little as $75 and as much as $2,000. And the average for a first trimester abortion is $500. Now, given that half of patients seeking abortions earn under 100% of the federal poverty line and a further quarter earn under 200%, that $500 cost can present a large barrier to access. And so um, for most other medical procedures, this cost could be mitigated through insurance, um, including for folks that are low income, Medicaid coverage, so state or federal insurance. But no federal funds may be used towards abortion except for very limited exceptions um, under the Hyde Amendment. Those states may allocate state funds and state Medicaid funds towards abortion procedures. Um, a further institutional background that's important is that the Affordable Care Act, which first took effect in some states in 2014 and others later as they chose to expand, um, expanded access to these Medicaid funds to folks earning 100, under 133% of the federal poverty line. Uh, moving forward, I call folks within that income bracket Medicaid qualifying, um, and that's just a notation. But as I mentioned, some states um, chose to expand and chose to cover abortions using state funds and others did not and chose to instead um, cover only those federally mandated under the Hyde Amendment, the very, very slim exceptions. Um, 14 states covered abortion throughout my entire sample period from 2010 to 2019 and four states changed their coverage over that period. The rest of the states did not cover at all. So here we see a large variation between states and some of that might be what you'd expect. You see some of the coasts in the dark blue, the coverage states, um, but there are some in the Midwest and in the um, Southwest that also covered abortion through this period. And so from this variation, I, um, I saw a natural experiment and a potential to see what this coverage does for women in states that, do, that can or cannot access um, state funds for abortion. And so to tease out these impacts, I turned to my methodology. I used a difference in differences over gender and state policy. And for a limited group, I use a triple difference over gender income and state policy. So my sample is from the current population survey between 2010 and 2019. And I split that into a younger cohort. So those are folks 18 to 24 and an older cohort of 25 to 45. The 18 to 45 limit is 
common within the literature as it's sort of the reproductive lifetime for most women. Um, but the younger group I assume to be I, um, in school or not yet completed with their education, not yet done with their educations. And I also assume that their income is exogenous as it would be determined by family situation, not necessarily their own economic situation. For the older group, I assume that they are done with their school and that their income um, is endogenous and a product of their education and labor decisions. And so using Guttmacher Institute and KFF Foundation um, information on state policies, I was able to then use those policies and this um, model to look at the impact in the current population survey, which has the labor, education outcomes, and demographic information. I'll note that this approach requires an assumption of parallel trends, which is one that I justify throughout my thesis. So to begin with a slightly more descriptive um, representation of my results, what we see here is a graph of the gender gap in student status. So this is constructed by taking the percent of women in my sample younger group who are still in school and subtracting the percent of men, um, again, in that younger sample who are in school. As you can see, those gray bars, which are the folks earning above 133% of the federal poverty line, are mostly consistent across the two different states. This is evidence for parallel trends, and it also makes sense, as we wouldn't expect folks that don't qualify for Medicaid to make their change their decisions based on changes in Medicaid coverage. Now, what's really interesting is if we look at these blue lines here. So the solid line are those states, solid blue line are those states that um, covered abortion and also that uh, for those folks who are within the Medicaid qualifying income bracket. Now, if we look at that dotted line, those are the non-coverage states, and we actually see the gender gap go negative. So there are more men within that income bracket attending school than women. And this is bucking trends for the last few decades of women obtaining more school than men. Women were able to catch up by around 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, but the fact that there was that much of an impact of Medicaid that was mitigated in those states um, that covered abortion is really interesting. And so to dig into this more, I turn to my regression results, um, which are somewhat blocked here, so I'll move myself. But um, if you look on the left, we see a sort of pseudo triple difference. And on the right, it's the actual triple difference. Um, and in both, we see a one to two percentage point increase in the chances a woman is in school um, in a covered state. Uh, and if we look at the older cohort for their education outcome, we see again a small but significant impact. It's about 10 days more education on average, but it was consistent under different levels of control. And so for these education results, I see two main drivers. The first being practical impact. So someone who is able to terminate an unwanted pregnancy may be able to attend school when had she had to have childcare and going through with the pregnancy would have had to drop out. On the other hand, we have expectations. If I expect that I can receive an abortion should I need one, I may feel more comfortable investing in my education um, now that that risk has been sort of mitigated. And so these two drivers, I assume, also impact my labor outcomes, which I'll turn to now. Um, the first is the late participation in the labor force. Um, as you see here, it's about half percentage point increase on the, that interaction term, um, and that's consistent under different levels of control. And um, we see that women work more in states where abortions are covered under Medicaid. Um, not only do they have a higher chance of working, but those who are working work longer hours. So this is usual hours worked, and it was only calculated for respondents reporting working at least one hour a week. And so we can see among the working population, um, those women in states where abortion is covered work more time, even though it's not very much, it's about eight minutes per week on average, it's significant and it's consistent under different levels of control. So from these results, I conclude that financial access to abortion increases uh, women's participation in their education, and it also increases their participation in the labor market. And so from here, we can draw a couple of different policy implications. So states policies, um, just in terms of insurance, vary widely. And now that we're in this post row world, physical access will also vary widely. And the gaps between states that have abortion and ones that don't should become even more stark. Um, as, I, we show, as I showed in this thesis, there is currently a gender gap between those states that have abortion coverage and those states that don't, where women are more able to participate in their education and the labor force in those states that have coverage. This 
could mean that in this post row world where states are, um, where the question of abortion access has been left up to the states, as we see more variance in state policy, we may also see more variance in women's economic outcomes. Um, this is something I believe policymakers should consider, especially now that abortion is going to be a legislative decision and not a court one. Um, but from that, I would like to thank you all for uh, listening. Hello, my name is Caroline Skinner, and today I am presenting on my thesis titled Examining Market Efficiency and the Reverse Favorite Long Shot Bias in National Football League Point Spread Markets After the Legalization of Sports Betting. So in 1992, Congress passed the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, which prohibited state-sanctioned gambling on sports, with a few exceptions such as Nevada. In May 2018, the Supreme Court struck down PAPSA in Murphy versus NCAA, thus allowing any state to legalize sports betting. Since then, 30 states and Washington, D.C. have legalized sports betting, as you can see from the map shown on the bottom right. In the three years since Murphy, sports betting has grown tremendously in popularity, especially with the rise of mobile sportsbook apps such as FanDuel. In fact, the U.S. sports betting market generated $1 billion in revenue in 2020 and is expected to grow to $6 billion by 2023. Next, I'll try to give a brief overview of the mechanics of the point spread betting market for those who aren't familiar. For each game, the sportsbook posts a point spread at which it is willing to transact, such as the Patriots being favored by three and a half points versus the Eagles, which is an example taken from the image of FanDuel's interface uh, on the right. Point spread bets generally offer 11 for 10 odds for either side of the bet, uh, which means that the better receives a profit of $10 for every $11 bet if their team covers the spread. So in order to break even, bettors must correctly pick uh, roughly 52.4% of their bets, assuming the same amount of money is wagered in each bet. The asymmetry of the 11 for 10 rule provides the bookmaker with a commission, and for standard odds, the sportsbook collects a commission of 4.54%, uh, which is quite a high transaction cost compared to other financial markets. Just like prices in the stock market, the spread for a given game may change over time as new information is revealed and absorbed. So at the start of the week, a handful of expert line makers in Las Vegas develop a consensus point spread for each game using statistical data. Then using this consensus as a guide, sportsbooks release their opening lines and bettors begin to wager on either side. And as the betting proceeds, sportsbooks have the opportunity to gather information based on how the public is wagering and slightly adjust the lines over the course of the week in order to converge to a relatively accurate spread. And now this is done usually al algorithmically and almost instantaneously. For example, if greater than 50% of money is bet on the Patriots in our example above, the bookmaker might increase the point spread to four or four and a half points to try to incentivize bettors to pick the Eagles in an effort to avoid a lopsided book, which occurs when the large majority of the betting action is concentrated on one side of the bet, exposing the sports book to potential financial losses. In theory, the point spread line is designed to attract an equal amount of money on both sides of the bet. If this is achieved, the sportsbook is able to profit from the commission with zero risk, regardless of the outcome of the game. However, often sportsbooks may consciously deviate from the market clearing price and instead take large positions with respect to the outcome of the game. This allows sportsbooks to achieve higher profits since they're generally more skilled at predicting game outcomes than the general public, and thus they can systematically exploit better biases. However, this often results in excess demand on one side of the bet and a systematic departure from the fair and rational spread. In sports betting, the fair spread is defined as the spread where both sides of the bet have a projected 50% probability of winning. My motivation for this paper was based on personal experience, especially seeing the rapid rise of sports betting mobile apps among young adults and my peers after legalization. Most sports bettors are avid sports fans and are often prone to overconfidence bias, which is when an individual overestimates their ability to correct, correctly predict the outcome of a game and believes that success is due to skill rather than luck. This may lead individuals 
uh, to act irrationally, inefficiently, or take excessive risks. Additionally, mobile sportsbooks have tried to maximize the entertainment value of gambling by gamifying the sports betting process using features such as free bets, odds boosts, and leaderboards. The gamification of sports betting encourages more frequent gambling, which can have negative consequences such as overspending and result in, neg in abnormally negative returns. We witnessed a similar phenomenon with the gamification of trading apps like Robinhood. Thus, I hypothesize that the entertainment value embedded within sports gambling allows economically irrational biases to persist and keeps bettors hooked, even if their realized returns are negative over the long run. Given the immense popularity of the NFL and the growing prevalence and gamification of online sports betting, I wanted to examine the efficiency of the NFL point spread market and the tendencies of this new wave of online bettors through the lens of behavioral economics in order to determine what biases may exist and whether they can be exploited to form a profitable betting strategy. I also explore whether point spreads have systematically diverged from the fair price in the post-legalization period. One of, the, uh, one of the most prominent inefficiencies that has been documented in sports betting markets is the reverse favorite long shot bias, which is the tendency of gamblers to overvalue favored teams and undervalue underdogs leading to above average expected losses. Stephen Levitt argues that NFL bookmakers tend to exploit their reverse favorite long shot bias by offering worse spreads for favorites such that they win less than 50% of the time but attract more than half of the betting action. However, all of the studies that I've noted below occurred prior to the widespread legalization of sports betting. And thus I wanted to revisit the issue to see if biases such as the reverse favorite long shot bias have persisted or been even exacerbated since the legalization of sports betting. Moving on to data and methodology, I'll try to keep the section brief as more detailed explanation and set of equations are provided in my thesis, but I collected point spread and outcome data for each game in the 2010 to 2021 NFL seasons. Then I conducted ordinary least squares regressions, which test for market efficiency by examining if the closing point spread line is an unbiased predictor of the actual game outcome. Another OLS regression is used to discern whether there's a systematic difference in point spread rationality between the pre and post legalization periods. <clears throat> I also tested to see if there were strategies which could profitably exploit hypothesized better biases, such as only betting on away underdogs, which is rule seven, or betting against the public, which is rule four. As this would indicate some form of inefficiency in the market as mispricing is able to persist. The full set of rules tested is listed in the bottom right. Finally, I trained a probit model using data from 2018 to 2020, 2020 and used it to forecast uh, 2021 NFL games. For the OLS regressions, I was unable to reject the null hypothesis that the NFL point spread market is characterized by rational expectations. However, the betting strategies provided more meaningful insights. None of the strategies tested were profitable in the pre-legalization period, yet rule five, which is inspired by the logic of the reverse favorite long shot bias and involves betting on the underdog when greater than 50% of the public money is bet on the favorite, produced statistically significant profits at the 5% level in both the period from 2018 to 2020 and 2021. This indicates that there was mispricing introduced in the market and supports the existence of the reverse favorite long shot bias in the NFL point spread market after legalization. Furthermore, the probit model revealed that in the post legalization period, there was a bias against home favorites, indicating that away underdogs were better value picks. Here you can see the profitability results for all seven rules with the 2018 to 2020 seasons on the left and the 2021 season on the right. Rule seven, um, which involves betting on only on away underdogs was significantly profitable at the 10% level from 2018 to 2020. And rule four, the strategy of betting against the public was significantly profitable at the 5% level in 2021. The rest of the rules were not significantly profitable with some even incurring large losses such as rule one. And uh, I don't show the results from 2010 to 2017 because none of the strategies tested uh, were profitable. 
And here I show the week by week profits earned by two of the profitable strategies using $100 bets uh, throughout the 2021 season. It's interesting that both of these profitable strategies involve betting against the public, meaning that my roughly $3,000 profit made using rule four also represents a $3,000 loss for the general pub betting public. Rule five in particular supports the hypothesis that NFL bookmakers tend to exploit better biases by offering worse spreads for favorites such that they win less than 50% of the time but attract more than half of the betting action. So rule five shows that when the public is overvaluing the favorite, it is advantageous to take the underdog as shown by the uh, nearly 20% return on investment for this strategy. In conclusion, since profitable gambling opportunities do exist, speculative inefficiencies such as the reverse favorite long shot bias seem to have appeared in the NFL point spread market after legalization. Yet, as we saw with the majority of betting strategies tested, it is hard to beat Vegas and sports betting is often a losing game, especially for casual bettors. Despite this, 31 million Americans bet on the Super Bowl this year. So I ask why? The additional utility derived from the suspense and surprise of cheering for the team that one has bet on must outweigh the risk and reality of financial losses. In fact, the aggressive gamification and promotions by sportsbooks can pay off by bringing in new users that will lose on average $2,000 over the course of their engagement with the app. American Gaming Association CEO Bill Miller explains that fans are the heartbeat of professional sports and leagues like the NFL are realizing the full potential of sports betting to drive fan engagement. But he also notes that it is the NFL's responsibility to educate fans and promote responsible gaming in order to mitigate gambling addiction and significant financial losses. Moving forward, it is critical to analyze the various ways that states can regulate these online sports books and limit exploitation, especially as they continue to rapidly grow. Currently, there are very few laws or other controls in place to protect consumers from misleading or even predatory marketing tactics. We also must assess what roles, if any, the federal and local government, sports books, and leagues like the NFL should play in preventing against exploitation, gambling addiction, or serious financial harm to the consumer. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.